Hi, everyone. Welcome to another Clean Machine Live. This is going to be an interesting one, looking at how diets affect both cortisol and testosterone, especially for those that are working out. And this one goes into a really interesting one because it affects men even more than women. And we'll see why getting too much protein can actually have the reverse intended effects. All right, so let's get started. Um, the disclaimer, this video is for informational and educational purposes only. It's not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Great. So the title of this one is High Protein Low Carb Diets Shown to Decrease Testosterone by 37%. Um, this is this is a pretty big bludgeoning of uh, testosterone. Um, so what's amazing about this, I'm gonna go ahead and pull up the study on there on the screen for you. Uh, this was a meta-analysis, so it was looking at a bunch of different studies, actually 27 different studies pulled together, and they looked at all the results from 27 different studies. So this is just not a one-off study with a small population. This was looking at a large uh, amount of people uh, over 27 studies and finding the similarities and extrapolating good data from there. So really interesting study. So the title of the study, as you can see on the screen, low carbohydrate diets and men's cortisol and testosterone, a systematic review and meta-analysis. Well, this is, this is pretty interesting because the results they found, and, and I'm just going to read it right from the study from you, to get this conversation started. So uh, they looked at uh, two different groups, a high, high protein um, diet, and what they considered high protein was 35% uh, or more of your total calorie intake for the day from protein. So uh, if you follow macros, that's a 35% of your total calories coming from protein. That's actually a, a lot. <laughs> That's a lot for any person. But here that uh, here's how it uh, calculates out. So uh, average male diet is about 2,500 calories. Now those uh, doing strenuous exercise, wanting to gain muscle or bodybuilding, that sort of things, athletes, performers, they're going to consume a bit more calories than the 2,500 calories. Um, but let's start with the average daily male at 2,500 and the average female at around 2,000 calories. Um, so the 2,500, then you multiply that times 35%, that's 875 calories coming from protein. You divide that by four kilocalories and every gram of protein, and that leaves you with around 220 grams of protein per day. Now that's about 73 grams of protein per meal if you're doing three meals per day. That's a lot of protein. Um, so, when you're looking at high amounts of protein, we're really talking very high amounts of protein in my book. Now, the really the only way to reach those kinds of levels of proteins is by overconsumption of uh, protein products or more likely the average consumption of um, animal products a large steak, a large burger for a lunch, eggs and, and you know bacon and that sort of thing. That type of protein ingestion can get you to that 200 plus grams of protein pretty easily without you even knowing it or being aware of it. And even if you're not active, that's kind of a typical day for an average American. So the average American is getting a very high amount of protein. So when they looked at low carbs, they're talking 35% or less of your calories at uh, of carbohydrates. So that's what they consider low carb. So over 35% for the protein, under 35% for of your total calorie intake for carbs as low. So that's where they get the definition of uh, high protein, low carb. Okay, so let's take a look at the study. Um, interestingly, they found, um, the title's a little of the study is a little confusing because it said low carbohydrate diets. And what it was really looking at is high protein, low carb diets. The typical Atkins or keto diet is a high protein, low carb diet. CrossFit diets, these things 
are high protein, low carb. Okay, so this is what they're talking about, not just low carb, but high protein, low carb. Okay, so what did they find? And I'll go ahead and put up right on the screen the exact quote from the study. A little bit long, so I'm not going to share if it's going to fit on the screen, but I will put it in the comments section too so you can read it. I'll see if I can. Yeah. Okay. There it is. All right. So a medium MP is medium protein, low carb diets had no consistent effect on resting testosterone. This was interesting. So if you were eating just average or, or below 35%, test, resting testosterone did not change. However, high protein, that's above 35% low carb diets caused a large decrease in resting testosterone. So this is really this is really ironic because you see some of these guys out there, you know, doing 2 to 300 grams of protein per day, right? Thinking, "Oh, I'm going to build muscle 200 300 grams of protein," right? It could actually be lowering and as you can see the very last sentence there, lowering their testosterone levels, resting testosterone levels 37% Oh my God, they're suppressing their body's ability to build muscle by suppressing testosterone. Okay, so this is kind of dual effect. All right, so when you look at testosterone, testosterone is in uh, kind of a seesaw relationship with cortisol. When cortisol levels go up, testosterone levels go down. When testosterone levels go up, they can uh, are usually coincided with lower cortisol levels. So they have kind of a counterbalancing effect. And it makes sense. Cortisol is a stress state. So your body is scavenging energy, taking energy from everywhere, including muscle tissue, breaking down muscle tissue and using it for energy. Testosterone is taking and utilizing energy. So one is tearing down, one is building up. Sorry, a little glitch there. My ABG is doing pop-ups on my window. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay. So cortisol and testosterone have countering effects. One builds muscle, one tears muscle down. One's using it for energy. The other is using it for accretion or muscle gains. All right. So when you usually see prolonged or chronic cortisol levels, you see decreased. You can actually even take cortisol and it will instantly, if you take it intravenously, cortisol will instantly reduce some inflammation, which is a good thing, which is why uh, people use cortisol drugs for that purpose. But they even warn you right on the package could reduce muscle, could create muscle loss. Well, let's take a look at this uh, amazing little graph that's in the study. I think it up here. So this is the top line is cortisol levels on a low carb diet. That's the solid line. That's cortisol on a low carb diet. On a high carb diet, you see the cortisol levels before. Now there's three things. One, uh, on a low carb diet, these start out with higher cortisol levels because the body is already under stress. The body thinks it's starving on a low carb diet or is in stress nutrient stress, not getting enough of the nutrients it needs. Then you exercise and the cortisol levels go up higher. When the body has sufficient amount of energy on a high car higher carb diet, the body isn't going to stress as much because it has what it needs. Remember, cortisol scavenges or goes out and seeks energy. So it's going to go out and create energy. Um, by liberating fat, but also um, storing fat once that cortisol is, is taken away. So you can see that a uh, low carb diet started out with higher cortisol, went way higher in cortisol levels. Remember, cortisol is competing with testosterone, so it's suppressing testosterone levels. And then sustained levels, even two hours after the workout, after the uh, resting workout, you had sustained levels of cortisol. That's where you get this sustained lowering of testosterone because of this low carb diet. The body is, thinks it's in starvation mode, so it's still 
busy scavenging. When you add a workout, you're increasing the caloric utilization or use, right? You're creating more demand on energy. So cortisol levels have to stay high. What this means is you're going to suppress testosterone levels because the body says, don't hang on to any of that protein. We've got to use it for energy instead of using it for muscle building. So this is, seems counterintuitive, I know. If you eat too much protein, you can actually increase uh, cortisol, tear down muscle, create muscle loss. Now we've seen this in multiple studies on the keto diet, low carb diets and exercise, that they actually lose more muscle on a keto diet, a high protein diet, and they're losing more muscle. Why? Two things. One, they're suppress they're increasing their cortisol, which is tearing down muscle tissue, and then they're suppressing uh, the function of uh, testosterone. But here's an interesting thing that this study pointed out: that, that the method of action is kind of interesting. Um, I'm going to go ahead and read it to you, and then I'll try to explain it. I'll read it directly verbatim from the study and then explain it because it's pretty interesting. The finding that high-protein, low-carb diets caused a large decrease in resting testosterone, while long-term low-carb diets had no effect on resting uh, testosterone, the body adapted over time. This suggests the observation group, subgroup effects in post-exercise testosterone are explained by protein intake rather than diet duration. So it wasn't the length of the study that really mattered. It wasn't how long people were on the low carb. It was the protein that was really causing this effect of suppression of testosterone. That's it, guys. You're eating that high protein diet, super high protein diet, and you are suppressing testosterone and reducing your body's ability to gain muscle and strength. You know, there it is. There's the research telling us just exactly what these guys uh, have been thinking was the truth is the exact opposite of the truth. And this is amazing that a plant-based diet can give you the right amount of protein instead of a diet too high in protein, like from animal sources that can actually suppress testosterone and increase cortisol, resulting in less uh, less uh, muscle gains. Now, here's uh, an interesting part of another study uh, that looked at a study out of the University of Texas. I'm going to go ahead and put it up on screen because it's kind of funny. I mean, it's not funny for people suffering from erectile dysfunction, but we do have to understand this. So these low-carb diets can be chronically elevating um, cortisol levels, right? Cortisol when you see it's not enough energy coming in from carbohydrates, it goes out to scavenge. So it keeps that cortisol level high. When you stress, you're adding more cortisol to that. So the average stress of the day, the stress of the diet, the stress of your relationship, the stress of family, the stress of money, all those stresses, and you add a workout on top of that, put physical stress, and then you, uh, you, you add low carb to the mix and it's really keeping elevated cortisol levels, you can see what happens. In this study, it said, according to the research, chronically elevated cortisol levels can produce impotence, erectile dysfunction, and loss of libido by inhibiting testosterone production in men. There it is. I mean, this, this, this Atkins diet, the keto diet, these are these are not good for men. <laughs> I've been eating a high carb diet 37 years, plant-based, 100% plant-based. And that's me at 59 years of age, yet on my 60th year of life and still in amazing shape, but without any drugs, without any animal products. I want to show people what can be done and do it in a healthy way. And I see these guys out there struggling because they're doing these fad based diets like keto and like Atkins and low carb diets. And they're going backwards. They're losing muscle. They're not gaining the strength gains. They're not getting the muscle gains. They're not getting in better shape. And they're not doing it healthy either. Low carb means you're definitely eating probably less plants 
And plants have most of the antioxidants, most of the phytonutrients, most of the blood sugar regulators, most of the, uh, the uh, polyphenols that are so rich and powerful and supportive to gut health and to everything else we do. It's all there in the plants. And when you go on a low carb diet, most of those carbohydrates are found in plants your fruit, your nuts, your seeds, your, your uh, vegetables and things like this, uh, starchy vegetables, um, grains, a good source of carbs. And these carbs are keeping the cortisol levels down so you can build it. And remember that seesaw, if you've got that chronically elevated cortisol, that's suppressing testosterone. If you can raise that testosterone and keep that cortisol down, you can get more of that testosterone active, more supporting muscle growth, higher libido, better energy rates, more better sleep, um, better confidence, self-confidence, all those effects. And look, both men and women require testosterone for these functions. Um, so this goes for both people, but this overconsumption of protein is just not necessary. So why do I consume protein? Well, I consume protein in a protein powder as a complement to what I'm eating to try to keep my caloric uh, in balance with my 25 to 3000 uh, uh, calorie load, because that what works for me. If I were to take in my protein from a food source, it would put me over in my total calories, my total fat, some of the other ratios that I'm looking at, and would get me into a calorie surplus, which means I would um, add body fat. And that's not what I want. I want to keep that body fat nice and low, not only for appearance, but for health sake. Um, better insulin, better response when I consume my food, better uh, microbiome, so all of these are, are important to look at. So uh, the mechanisms of actions were interesting. I'm going to go into this in just a second and, and show you that, but I'm going to go ahead and put it in there up on the board because this is pretty interesting when I was reading this study that they were proposing the mechanism of action happens in this very interesting relationship. I'm going to go ahead and put it up on the screen once it goes into the comments section. But high protein intakes may depress post-exercise total testosterone to maintain upregulation of the urea cycle. This is where uh, the body breaks down protein and turns it into nitrogen and urea and to be able to flush it out in urine and feces. Um, I'll go ahead and put this on there because this is really fascinating to me. So um, what it's doing is when you get enough protein, the body will stimulate muscle protein synthesis. When you get too much, the body says, whoa, wait a minute, let's put the brakes on muscle protein synthesis and let's start focusing this energy on the urea cycle, which is breaking down that protein and getting it out of the body because you don't want an overproteinated bloodstream. You don't want an overproteinated body because it can start causing ill health effects. So what you want to do is break that down. And what the body does is put a, put a kibosh on your testosterone, it says, all right, testosterone, stop doing your work. We got to work on trying to remove this excess protein from the body. Now, I find this pretty fascinating. So finding the right amount of protein that gets you into muscle growth and muscle maintenance and healthy repair of your muscles, you can see this or you can actually even feel it by if your muscle soreness lasts for more than two to three days and you're doing strenuous exercise, resistance training, and you're getting muscle soreness, that means your muscle recovery is not happening in a fair amount of time. Actually, on a, those many studies have shown those on a plant-based diet have accelerated muscle protein recovery. Um, muscle recovery periods because of the high antioxidants, the polyphenols, the fiber, the rich uh, other things uh, converting into butyrates and helping offset inflammation and stuff like this. So much faster recovery. That's one of the nice benefits of being a plant-based athlete is the speed of the recovery times. But if you're not getting sufficient amount of proteins, the body can't rebuild and repair those torn or damaged 
proteins um, that are in the muscle tissue either as well. So trying to find that right balance for you in each and every individual based on your age, based on your metabolism, based on so many different factors. That's why I don't like when people say, oh, you should do 1.2 grams or 1.6 grams or whatever the grams is. That's maybe right for some of the people, but everybody's an individual. You may have health problems. You may have digestive issues. You may have um, all kinds of different situations going on in your body that is specific to you as an individual. And that's why I don't believe in that. I believe in really finding out for yourself. What you want to do is ideally find the lowest amount of protein that gets you into a uh, maintenance cycle or a growth cycle just enough to get you to that level where you're uh, adding muscle if that's your goal or maintaining your physique if that's your goal without adding more calories that would cause body fat retention or, or excess body fat. Because remember, whether it's fat, protein or carbs, all three of them can be stored as body fat. They're all energy. They all break down to basically the same carbohydrates, um, carbon and hydrogen. It's, that's all they are. Amino acids are carbon and hydrogen molecules with some other things in there too, nitrogen. So uh, they all break down to basically the same thing. They can be all used by the body for energy and they can all be stored in energy as fat. So yes, even protein can be converted and stored as fat in the body. Now, protein does have a thermic effect. So as a slight, it takes more energy to break down and convert protein into usable energy. So it expends energy. And for some people, people use protein in that way. So that's harder for the body to work. The body has to work harder and use up more calories in that thermic effect. Thermic meaning heat, body's releasing heat when it's using energy or, or using energy to cause the creation, the conversion of protein to fat. Well, this was a pretty amazing study. Um, uh, yeah, so uh, Raymond asked, uh, there, I have no doubt. Oh, go ahead and put the question on the screen. Thanks for the great, great comment uh, question, Raymond. I have no doubt that too much animal protein causes a lot of problems, but can you get too much? plant-based protein. Well, there was a really good study that actually looked at this. They looked at uh, high amounts of protein. And, and again, this was uh, looking at a huge body of people, thousands of people. And they looked at high amounts of protein in animals and high amounts of protein using plant sources of protein. And the in the study, it showed there was a 400% increase in cancer risk when the protein was uh, high protein intake was from animals, yet none of that cancer risk was seen. And actually even cancer reduction was seen if the same amount of high protein was in plants. Now, why is this? One, uh, animal proteins contain higher methionine. Methionine feeds cancer cells. Uh, animal proteins contain higher fat, generally saturated fat. We know this contributes to diabetes. The animal protein group, the high animal protein group had a 500% increase in diabetes, whereas the high protein plant group actually had a reduced risk of diabetes. So big differences in the way the animal proteins work in the body, even at higher levels. So the same amount of high protein from an animal product is not the same amount of high protein effect on the body from plant products. Plants have fiber, plants have, which uh, is converted uh, to butyrates. These are anti-inflammatory in the system. Uh, animal proteins is usually coupled with uh, omega-6 fatty acids in the form of arachidonic acid. Arachidonic acid is purely pro-inflammatory. So every time you're eating animal products, you're getting arachidonic acid in there, and that is pro-inflammatory. When you eat plant products, you're getting fiber. Whole food plant products, you're getting fiber. The bacteria convert that into butyrates, which is anti-inflammatory. Also the antioxidants, the micronutrients, the phytonutrients, the polyphenols that are in plants are not found in animal products at all. And these are the difference between pro-inflammatory uh, uh, consumption of animal products and anti-inflammatory consumption of plant proteins. So the proteins themselves, the makeup is different. 
the animal proteins have higher methionine and cysteine. These have been linked to cancers, to um, heart attacks, strokes, and diabetes, whereas plant proteins are lower in these amino acids. So the amino acid profiles are different in animal proteins versus plant proteins. And that's why they behave so differently. But that's just one of the factors. There's cholesterol. There's the way it uh, digests in the microbiome, the effect that the metabolites that have, the way we digest these foods, the saturated fat content in animal products, the heme iron that is in chicken, fish, and even uh, and, and beef and lamb and pork, and all of that has heme iron, and it is a known carcinogen. So big difference, whereas plants don't have any heme iron at all. So there's so many different ways, TMAO, there's so many different factors that plants actually um, create more um, sex hormone binding globulin. Sex hormone binding globulin goes into binds into testosterone to keep it from being used by cancer cells, right? Can't be used once it's bound. Higher amounts of, they've shown that, um, uh, in a in really nice study, they showed that um, men that were on a vegan diet, a plant pure diet, had higher testosterone, total testosterone levels than those eating a animal-based diet, but they also had higher levels of uh, sex hormone binding globulin. So that makes that active level about the same as meat eaters. So this is really interesting because what does that mean? It means your body has access to bound ones when that's liberated that you don't get when eating an animal-based diet. So big difference in how that uh, uh, testosterone is utilized, how it's stabilized and prevented from being just active. When you have less sex hormone binding globulin in the body, that means more of it is active and it can do stuff, but it can also stimulate um, uh, cancer growth cell. And that's another one of the reasons why we see the exact same amount of high protein in animals causing cancer in the same amount of protein gram for gram, not causing cancer in humans um, in multiple studies. So you can check that out. I've posted those studies. You can check out some of my other reviews, but there are a couple of good things out there that do improve testosterone. And I've found a couple of them, and these are natural plants. This is how I can get myself into a natural testosterone level that uh, will be uh, great for exercise, for muscle recovery, and stuff like that. Yet the plant-based diet makes sure we stabilizes those and keeps that testosterone level safe so it's not stimulating cancer growth. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this one. Uh, there's huge differences between what we're consuming and the results we're getting and the research is coming out. I'll continue to keep sharing this research so you understand what's going on inside the body based on the latest research. This is a great study. Check it out. Read it when you get a chance. Showing uh, the detrimental effects of a high protein that's 200 grams of protein for the average male and um, and or higher and and that's really suppressing testosterone up to 37 percent lowering your body's ability to increase muscle and decrease body fat um, so the research is there it's a meta-analysis looking at 27 studies it's not a one-off i'm not cherry picking a study this was an amazing meta-analysis looking at 27 different studies pulling together the information and I'm, I'm out, that's why I was excited to get this one out there and show you guys that the overconsumption of protein is not necessary. There is a proper place for consuming protein powders. It's that to get a sufficient amounts of protein without adding a bunch of calories that would be normally in certain higher protein foods. Higher protein foods, obviously beans are great for that, but real high intake of beans can give you a lot of gas <laughs> and can cause problems there. Higher intake of beans like tofu. Tofu is really high in fat. So uh, you consume a lot more tofu, you're consuming a lot more fat calories that may or may not be your desired effect. So there is um, uh, uh, really good research out there. Oh, I've got a good question from Let's see. 
I'll put that up on the screen. What are your thoughts when Dr. McDougall talks about uh, no more than eight ounces of beans a day for women with osteoporosis? Is he accurate or is this misunderstanding on his part? Um, I, in general, don't uh, try to contradict any of the other plant-based doctors out there. I think there's enough research out there on both sides of the story to argue it either way. Um, uh, I think it's probably, I think we're getting a little bit too, I want to be cautious with this because I don't want to, I, I respect the plant-based doctors out there, although I may disagree with them on certain things. Um, I, I think sometimes when looking at the research, we can get a little too hung up on details. And when we look at the average consumer out there just trying to eat the right thing, look, if we were in the wild, would we be concerned or if we're getting eight ounces of beans? No, we'd be eating until we're full. You know, this is we've come to a place where the research is being taken, I think, a little too literal um, and a little too, I mean, eight ounces of beans, really? <laughs> I have not seen any research um, on, on anything of ill effects caused by consuming more than eight ounces of beans. If he's got studies out there, I'd love to see them. But I think we're getting a little ridiculous when we start nitpicking at these things. You know, people get into this, oh, I can't have this, I can't have that. When you get into the I can'ts, you're really adding more stress to the body then probably any good you're doing by avoiding this, you know, like, oh, I, I can't do any oil at all, even if there's a hint of oil in something. And it's like, do you realize that amount is like 10 calories? It's not that much. <laughs> Look, I, I realize people are trying to do their best, but if we keep touting these restrictions all the time to people, we're going to scare people away from uh, enjoying really good, whole, healthy foods and, and using nutrition to our advantage. Um, I, I just hate all these rules. You can't do this. You can't eat this. You can't do salt. You can't do this. It's like, oh, my God, I, people are, are get into such restriction mindset. How can you enjoy life? How can you enjoy food? I mean, to me, I'd rather enjoy food, be relaxed, be happy. Being happy, that is a big impact on your overall health. Remember, chronic stress reduces testosterone, reduces your ability to recovery, it can even cause erectile dysfunction and impotence in men who are chronically stressed all the time. If we're stressed about what we're eating, that's what we're doing three, four, five times a day. Why do that to yourself? Let's just use understanding. Let's use the research that's available out there to make the best decisions for us and not fill ourselves with lives with a bunch of restrictions and rules that we have to live by or feel like we have to live by to, to the point where most people will say, screw this, I don't want to do this anymore. This is not fun. I can't keep up with it. I, I just caution the doctors out there, you know, saying, oh, you can't do this, you shouldn't do that, you shouldn't eat this, you shouldn't eat. There's too much shouldn'ts out there. And I think we should focus on what we should do to uh, support and enjoy life, to be in the best of health, yes, but not to the point where you're so obsessive that it's, uh, it's, it's reducing the quality of life. Enjoy your food. Enjoy what it does to your body. Once you know what it does to the body, I think you'll make good choices for yourself. Use biofeedback. See how it feels. Eat something. And if you eat a lot of something and it feels okay, well, great. If it starts to add body fat to you, maybe not so good. So use that biofeedback mechanism. Let your body talk to you, but learn to listen to it. Look for the signs and just start choosing stuff that you will enjoy eating and have fun with it. And remember uh, to be respectful, give thanks for the food that we eat and for the nutrition that fills us. Thank you plants for all of this amazing uh, stuff that we're finding out through the research. When we do a good, healthy, whole, base, whole food, plant-based diet and exercise. Enjoy the day. I hope you enjoyed this one. It was a great study. Thanks for joining me.